We'll now continue with the structural safety presentation. We'll go now into part two with what's new going into further details compared to the overview that we provided previously. In 1804A, regarding excavation near foundations, there's been a clarification that those excavations occurring near existing foundations shall not reduce the vertical or lateral support without protection or underpinning. This was likely being done on projects. There's now just an explicit code requirement to recognize that there ought to be protection provided if there's loads that are vertical. It was there previously for lateral. Regarding site grading on 1804A.4, there is an exception to which addresses previous code conflicts for slopes that you were all likely familiar with previously. And this relates to the impervious surfaces can be sloped less than 2% at the door landing or ramp to meet the accessibility maximum slope requirements that are covered in Chapter 10 related to egress. Specifically, those were sections 1010A.1.5, 1012A.3, or 1012A.6.1. It's good that this has now been explicitly recognized and now addressed in the code. For 1810A.3.5, dimensions of deep foundation elements, so the model code has provided clarification related to the minimum and maximum dimensions for cast in place deep foundations that also apply to grouted in place deep foundations. For 1810A3.5.2, cast in place or grouted in place, some of the new language is, is seen in these subsections here, 1810A35.2.1 for cased conditions where you can have cast in place or grouted in place in deep foundation elements. Again, that or grouted in place is the new language, similar for the next subsection. For uncased situations, cast in place or grouted in place in deep foundations, and these would have a 30 times the specified diameter, so this recognizes that there may be differences regarding the actual site, construction site diameter, and that the limit is based upon that which is specified on the approved construction documents. And this is similar in the language also seen for the exception associated with this same subsection. For 1811A.3 regarding geotechnical requirements, and this is applicable for pre-stressed rock and soil foundation anchors, there's been a modification to the corrosion requirements and the load test limits. So if you have these on your project, these would be of interest to you. There's now, for items 7 and 8, there's some new language that's reflected here. A minimum of a Class 2 corrosion protection is required for temporary anchors in service less than or equal to two years. Previously, this had language that was associated with the requirements that were specified in a geotechnical report. Now it's limited to two years based upon this code language. For item 8, related to loading, for those loads, those shall not exceed 80% of the specified minimum strength of the tendons. And then the, for the production test anchors, shall be tested to ultimate load or maximum of, 80 per, of 0.8 times the specified minimum tensile strength of the tendon. And you can see that this language is just to ensure consistency between those two requirements as far as 80% of the specified minimum. So you may see some of these on your projects should you have these kinds of rock or soil anchors occurring. But these again will be identified on the drawings, so this is going to be something that the design professional will need to specify on the approved construction documents. For 1812A.2, regarding the duration for earth retaining shoring, we're seeing a similar timeline here now with two years in item seven above. So the shoring is considered temporary if it remains for less than two years. Previously, the language was for one year. So now the rule of thumb then is for two years, based upon this code language. Regarding concrete and welding of reinforcing wires in the section 1903A.8, which makes reference to ACI 318.14, which is the same reference standard that we have had during the 2016 code, in the sections shown 26.6.4.1 A and B, 
There has been some clarifying language for allowing and noting the requirements for fusion welding of holding wires and reinforcing steel cages that have become more common. These relate to the particular materials that must be specified, where these are located on the reinforcing steel cage, and even within the, with respect to bend locations and so on. What are the quality control requirements as well as documentation and tests associated with these types of pencil rods or holding wires of, as they are sometimes referred to. For shotcrete, some new language here, mainly related to the relocation of what was a previous minimum of concrete strength of 4,000 PSI that was associated with the 2016 intervening amendment which was added previously as an exception, has now been relocated into the main subsection of 1908A.1. We've also revised the surface cleaning requirement by sandblasting to be through a mechanical method that's acceptable to DSA based upon environmental concerns that have been associated with sandblasting. For 1908A.9, the curing requirements that were specified during the 2016 intervening amendment language, which was as an added exception, has been repealed because the new 50 degree maximum or 50 degree Fahrenheit requirement, not necessarily maximum, but actually that's a, a minimum for what it needs to be, uh, since this new 50 degree Fahrenheit requirement is, is acceptable now for all cases compared to the previous language, which was a little bit more specific based upon the particular condition for the references mentioned in that previous amendment. For 1912A.12, with respect to placing of shotcrete, it's clarifying now that compliance is required both with ACI 506R and 506.2. Regarding the TMS masonry code, so there's a change, as was previously mentioned, because there's now a new reference standard, that's for the 2016. As was mentioned before, it's generally been reorganized and reformatted. So for the building code requirements in 402-16, there have been some changes in the definitions or terminology. For example, the definitions for beam, cavity, collar, joint, pilaster, and wall. And interestingly, they've actually deleted the definition for pier. However, the CBC 2107A.4 adds a section to the TMS 402, and that's 8.3.8, .8, for wall and pier definitions which govern over the model reference. Also, with regards to terminology within the model reference here, they've replaced the word element with member throughout for consistency regarding those concepts. Regarding the anchor bolt strength equations, those have been modified, and you can see some of the modifications if you were to take a look at section 8.1.3 and 9.1.6 of the 402.16. These are largely going to be of interest to design professionals. However, as a result of the nature of those equations, what you may see as inspector is fewer or smaller anchor bolts than what you've seen previously, because based upon research they found that the equations previously provided were too conservative so they've recognized these the improved accuracy with these new equations therefore you may see fewer anchor bolts accordingly continuing on with regards to the reference standards so now for the TMS 402 again now still the 402 16 continuing with respect to anchored veneer, maximum cavity requirements have been increased from the previous maximum of four and a half inches up to six and five eighths now. You can take a look at those awfully long subsections, which I won't repeat here, but you may see an increase in anchorage connections because those are required given the increase in that gap of six and five eighths compared to what was the previous gap. So keep this in mind for those projects where you do see this increase in that gap cavity specified on the drawings. Some design professionals may still choose to not go to this extent, but they might, and if they do, be aware that there are increased anchorage requirements. With regards to the quality assurance tables, those have actually been removed from the 402, but that's 
because they are now located in the 602. They were previously in the 602 as well, and there was duplication between the 402 and 602, but now everything is contained within the 602. They've been consolidated, reorganized, and reformatted. We'll talk about that next in some of the following slides. Additionally, there's been consolidation of reinforcement requirements in chapters 8, 9, and 11 to chapter 6. So previously, the design professional had to do some navigating of these different chapters. Now everything's contained within one chapter. Now moving on to the 602, which is, is the specification for masonry structures. There's been some new materials that have been specified. There's been, it's been added to reference cast and manufactured stone materials, and you can take a look at sections 1.3 and 2.3, or I should say articles 1.3 and 2.3 in the specification, the masonry specification. They've also added qualification and submittal requirements for the special inspector. Take a look at section 1.6b2. This of course would be of interest to you as the project inspector, but of course this is also going to be verified by the lab manager for some of those requirements. There's also added qualification requirements for the field and laboratory technicians when they occur on a given project, and you can look at those articles 1.6A1 and B1 for further information about those. And as mentioned earlier, the quality assurance tables have been reorganized and reformatted. There are still the same tasks as what you saw in the 2013 code, but now all three quality assurance levels are in a single table rather than being in separate tables. So now table three is for tests. Whether or not a given test is required or not is based upon the particular quality assurance level that has been identified on the approved construction documents and then you can see which one would be required based on that identification. And table four applies to special inspections. Whether or not a special inspection is continuous, periodic, or not required at all again based upon the quality assurance level that has been specified on the approved documents that correlates with one of the levels indicated in that table 4. For 1705A.4, masonry construction continuing now in chapter 17A, we previously noted that there were, because of the changes in the reference standard, we had to make changes to the identification of the levels associated with that for masonry structures. So now we have to say level three for buildings and structures. This is similar to what was required previously for level C. And for veneer, it's level two, which used to be B. And these are in the inspections now per TMS 402.16 and table 402.16 tables three and four. IR 21.1 now clarifies the required DSA tests and special inspections for non-structural walls. You should make sure to check the DSA approved construction documents as well as the 103 for the requirements for your particular project. There's been some new sections added to the CBC, section 2105A.5 and 2105A.6, which now explicitly reference the TMS specification this is the 602.16 for PRISM method, which is in articles B.3 and B.4, and the unit strength method, which is covered in B.2. Regarding masonry units covered in section 2103A.1, the references to verify material compliance are now covered in some of these new references. The TMS 602.16, Article 2.3, which covers for concrete masonry units. The TMS 504.16 and ASTM C1364 are new, and those apply to architectural cast stone. This is considered to be an alternative system per CBC 2104A.1. Therefore, you should be sure to check your construction documents for additional construction construction requirements that are associated with this particular product because they may be unique to those particular scenarios since they are not very common. ASTM C1670 is a new ASTM reference in the building code for adhered manufactured stone masonry veneer units. Regarding mortar in 2103A2.1, again with the new reference standard TMS 40216, section 
13.6 requires type S mortar for exterior glass unit masonry. Regarding metal reinforcement and accessories in section 2103A.4 of the CBC, there's now alternative testing per that is applicable for unidentified reinforcing that is often used for concrete unidentified reinforcing and that's now allowed to be used for masonry unidentified reinforcing bars and this is consistent with what has been identified in IR 1710 and makes reference to section 1910A2 which has been around for a while. In a sense the metal reinforcing bars do not know what they're going into so why there were different requirements has always left us scratching our head a bit so we've recognized that this is acceptable when you have unidentified reinforcing bars for masonry you can still make use of the same testing that occurs for concrete reinforcing bars. Regarding 2106A.1.1 .1, item 1 for reinforcement, while we've had the same requirement regarding the minimum reinforcing steel of number 4 bars at 24 inches on center vertical and horizontal for walls, with a reduction in spacing to 16 inches on center maximum for vertical bars when you have stack bond for masonry. There is an exemption that has been included in the new code and that references that when you have reinforced hollow unit masonry and freestanding site walls or interior non-bearing non-shear wall partitions you are allowed to increase that horizontal reinforcing spacing up to four feet on center when there's running bond. If there's a stack bond it's reduced to two feet on center and this is consistent with what has been allowed in IR 21-1 for quite some time. But now that allowance is recognized with specific code language. Regarding lap splices in 2107A21, the requirements that we had there previously or that was through an amendment that limited the maximum lap splice to 72 bar diameters has been repealed because that language is now in the model code. Regarding low lift construction in section 2104A.1.3.1.2.2 .1 we still have the maximum pore height of 4 feet however we now allow that to be increased to 5 foot 4 for 10 inch nominal and larger hollow unit masonry and this is through an exception and this is going to this is similar to the language in the TMS 60216 table 7 and the height specified in that table regarding masonry core testing in section 2105A.4 we've clarified the exception for exception 1 that coring for non-structural walls having a maximum height of 12 feet is to be measured from the top of foundation. Previously that said from the base of the wall and we found that there was some inconsistencies in the application of that so now we've clarified that's from the top of the foundation of that wall. Regarding 1705A.2.5 for inspections and tests of structural welding we're moving on to steel here so again, with the in tests, there's not necessarily any new tests. We're just recognizing that tests occur for structural welding. So when you have non-destructive testing, there are some minimum requirements that the personnel associated with that, there needs to be a minimum non-destructive testing level 2 personnel. And again, recall that this is one of the elements that you must verify based upon the requirements in the administrative code, section 4-342B1. And this minimum level for personnel is to match the requirements indicated in IR 17.2. You can see Chapter 17A, the T&I section, for more, sec for more changes associated with that. Regarding high strength bolts, previously A325 and A490, as well as the twist off F1852 and F2280, those have now been replaced by F3125. 
Interestingly, this is not adopted by the RCSC specification for structural bolts because that was the 2014 edition and this ASTM change occurred, I think, in 2015 after that. However, because the AISC 316, I'm sorry, AISC 360 2016 edition came out after that, this ASTM is now adopted by ASTM 3125. You can refer to IR 17.8 for further information. Very briefly for you as project inspectors, you will now likely see on your projects where there is high strength bolting and fasteners occurring, they will now reference to ASTM F3125 but then the grade will be grade 325 or 490, which are similar to what was previously specified for the A325 and A490 or F1852 or F2280. Continuing on now with steel and some more of the detailed changes associated with structural steel. So for the AIC 360, the 2016 edition, the specification for structural steel buildings, there's new material standards that have been adopted in this new reference standard, specifically for hollow structural sections, ASTM A1065 and A1085. You can take a look at section A2F for more information about those, or at least the specific, specific reference to those standards. For plates, ASTM A1066 is now also recognized, and that's in, again, the same reference of section A2F. High strength fastener assemblies, which we just briefly mentioned in the previous slide, again, ASTM F3125 essentially combines the previous A325, A490, F1852, F, and F2280. It also now incorporates an F3043 and F311. These are proprietary and considered a, or referred to as a new group C, but those are proprietary high strength fasteners. And those are covered in sections A2F and J3.1. There's also the new electrode welding standard, welding electrode standard, AWS A5.36, and that's referenced in section A2G. And of course, the 2014 RCSC, which we've briefly mentioned before, that's an A2H. As a result of these new material standards that have been recognized in these reference standards, you may start to see these identified in the approved construction documents on your projects because the design professionals are specifying them in accordance with these new reference standards. For those changes in structural steel that relate to bolted changes, so for the high strength bolting changes, take a look at section J3 of the AISC 360 2016 edition. They've actually increased the minimum pretension requirements for group A bolts. These are those that are at the A325, F1852, and A354 grade BC when the diameter is more than one inch. You can take a look at reference table J31 for what that is. The reason for this is because the ASTM F3125 removed the minimum tensile strength drop that we used to see when you had a larger than one inch diameter bolt. So it used to be 105 KSI, now it's 120 KSI for all bolt diameters. Therefore, because of that increase in strength, there's a corresponding increase in the minimum pretension requirements for such bolts. ASTM F3125 also increased the maximum diameter that would be associated with those that are referred to oftentimes as twist-off bolts. Those are the ones identified by ASTM F1852 and 2280. That's been increased from one and an eighth inch max up to one and a quarter inch max now. As mentioned briefly previously, there is an, a new group that's been added. This is group C, and this refers to ASTM F3043 and F3111. However, there are limitations regarding use of these high strength fasteners, which are generally going to be in non-corrosive environments and so on. The bolt hole size has increased to be larger than one inch diameter let me rephrase that. 
the bolt hole size has been increased when you have a bolt diameter that is larger than one inch, is that is one inch or larger in diameter. You can refer to table J33. This has been done to help improve field fit up situations. This is because previously there were some conflicts between what was allowed in the AISC versus what the tolerances were that were allowed in ASME B18.2.6 because for the larger diameter of bolts there were larger manufacturing tolerances that were permitted for those and that led to problems that the hole sizes didn't quite work even though everything else about the fastener was in compliance with what was allowed in those other references. So this helps to address that. Regarding chapter N of the AIC 360 specification, chapter N quality control and quality assurance, for N5, item 5, the modified NDT requirements have occurred and this relates to what the rejection rate is associated with ultrasonic testing. Specifically, there's no ultrasonic testing reduction for projects in which there are 40 welds or less. There are other requirements also which you can look at in that section. Therefore, make sure that your lab and special inspector are aware of these changes because we don't want them to think that the reductions that applied for more welds than 40 can still be applied in those situations. Because that was industry practice for some time, this is going to be something that labs and special inspectors may need to be alerted to. There's also been a renaming, renumbering, and updating for the various subsections in Chapter N of the AIS AISC. And recall that CBC 1705A.21 notes which sections are not adopted and those have been updated to reflect these renaming, renumbering, and so on. For other changes that are not identified here in this slide, you can take a look at AIC summary document comparing the 22 and 2016 specifications in the link provided. Now we'll move on to changes in the seismic provisions in the 2016 edition. The first item is recognizing new HSS material standards such as ASTM A1085 and you can look in the AISC 341 section A3.1B for further reference information about that. There's also been an increase in the seismic load demands on what are often referred to as the corner columns. Uh, those are the columns that share either two or more lateral force resisting systems in two different, di different directions. You can reference D1.4A. And while that's primarily of interest to design professionals, what you are likely to see as a project inspector is perhaps fewer occurrences of these corner columns that maybe would be occurring on common on moment frames or braced frames in different directions. But not only might you not see those as often, but if they do occur, they may be larger in dimension or they might also be increases in thickness if not in dimension if not in the outside dimension, say for HSS members. This next one was a bit of a surprise for me when I came across it, and that is that now they previously prohibited partial joint penetration welding is allowed on special moment frames at column splices and bases. This has been a result of some, some research and testing, but due to those, there are now special details that are required if you see PJP welded column splices and bases. And those special details relate to particular dimensions, tapering, access holes, and so on. You can take a look at section E 3.6G for further information. And as you might expect, non-destructive testing, or NDT, is required, and that's covered in section J6.2B. Continuing on with the changes in the seismic provisions for structural steel buildings, there's been further modifications and clarifications related to moment frame connections. The doubler plate geometry and welding has been modified and revised somewhat. You can take a look at E3.6E for further information about that. 
There's also been modifications and revisions to the continuity plate geometry and welding associated with those, and that's in E3.6F. As a result of these changes, you may see thinner plates being used for continuity plates because now the thickness must be at least or greater than three-fourths of the beam flange thickness. In the past, it used to be at least equal to the beam flange thickness. Design professionals may still specify that as being the same thickness, but some design professionals may start to go for this allowed reduction of down to roughly three-fourths of the beam flange thickness. Regarding protected zones, there's now a recognition that power actuated fasteners can be applied in the protected zone provided that the size of them are less than or equal to 0.18 inches in diameter. And you can reference to section I 2.1D for information about that. With regards to pre-qualified connections for special intermediate steel moment frames for seismic applications, this is AISC 358. Recall that it's now the 2016 edition compared to the 2010 edition previously. There are now some new connections specified in this standard. There's now a Simpson strong tie, strong frame moment connection, and an image of that is seen here on the right, and that's in chapter 12. There's also now a double T moment connection, and that's covered in chapter 13. And that's again pictorially represented to the right of that section. Regarding the code of standard practice for steel buildings and bridges, AISC 303 is the 2016 version compared to the 2010 version previously. There have been some modifications to chapters 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 9, and 10. Of interest to you as project inspectors is some information here related to the tolerances for items we're about to go over. When it comes to curved members that are in a fabrication shop, that tolerance has been, speci that has been modified compared to the previous edition, and that's included in section 6.4.2. Regarding anchor rod placement in the field, take a look at section 7.5.1. This now achieves consistency with the AIC 360 specification hole size, as well as the tolerances that are allowed in ACI 117. Section 7.5.1b allows the horizontal tolerance to be more than or equal to a quarter of an inch. That tolerance amount is based upon the rod diameter. However, recall that in section CBC 2204A.4 that there's going to be some special detailing requirements at the base plate when oversizing is more than an eighth of an inch for the size of the fastener. That's usually going to be at lateral force resisting system columns, such as moment frame columns, brace frame columns, and so on. Therefore, make sure you look at your construction documents for those special details that would likely be specified by the design professional to be in compliance with these CBC amendments, which are more restrictive than what the model reference allows. With regards to high strength fasteners and the reference standard for that, the 2014 replaces the 20 replaces the 2009 version for the RCSC. Interestingly enough, we've reverted back to the snug tight definition from the 2004 RCSC, that is essentially just a few impacts with an impact wrench or full effort of an iron worker using a spud wrench bringing the plies into firm contact. That was the definition previously, which was taken out, has now been put back in. With regards to tolerances for turn of the nut pretensioning method, that's now been adjusted and that's now included in Table 8.2 of the 2014 RCSC. For all nut rotations now, they're allowed to exceed it by 60 degrees, but be within 30 degrees. In the past version of the 2009, they had to be plus or minus 30 degrees when they, were, when they had to make it within a half of a turn. 
or they had to be plus or minus 45 degrees if they had to do so within two-thirds of a turn. There's been a removal of the, a of the reference to ASTM F1136 that was a coding reference for F1852 and F2280. You can see table 2.1 for that. And this is because the coding is not approved for use on twist-off tension control boat bolts. The reference in AIC 36016 changes for the high strength bolts for further information. Make sure that the laboratory of record and, and high strength bolting special inspector are aware of these. With regards to the CBC, there's been a relocation of what was in 2016 CBC 2203A1 which had identification information to 2202A.1 and this was due to the model code relocating definitions to chapter 2 that have been mentioned previously. There's also been a renumbering of the remaining subsections in 2203A to minimize the impact on other section numbers. We repealed the 2016 CBC section 2205A31 related to protected zone identification, which previously modified AISC 341.10, section A4, and we've already covered this in earlier parts of this presentation. Now moving on to cold formed structural steel, the AISI S240, the 2015 edition. This now references to the AISI S202 2015, and it functions similar to the AISC 303 we covered already. Interestingly, Chapter D has quality control and quality assurance requirements. However, recall that the quality control and quality assurance definitions covered in the CBC actually govern over what may be specified in this particular specification. Chapter D.6 has quality assurance provisions that are similar to AISC. Some of the language that's used there is similar in the sense that they use the words observe, perform, and document. Tables in D.6 summarize many of the testing and inspection items and may be of use to use an inspector. However, recall that the CBC amended AISC requirements to match current practice and maintain continuous versus periodic special inspection. Though that same approach that used for the AISC should also be followed when it comes to cold form steel as well. Also, the administrative code and CBC amendments in Chapter 17A govern over the AISC 240 Chapter D when conflicts occur. For example, AWSCWI is required by the CBC 17A but in the AISI, an AWS AWCWI, that is an associate welding inspector, certified inspector is allowed in the AISI S240, but the CBC governs. Similarly, non-conformance identification requirements are more extensive in the administrative code than they are in the AISI S240, and so on. So the more restrictive requirements covered in the administrative code and the CBC Chapter 17A govern over these. Continuing on with cold form steel, AISIS 400. Now in chapter, in the CBC 2211A.1.1.2, item two, we continue prohibiting shear walls using gypsum board, which are now in AISIS 400, sections E5, E6, and E7. E4, which is for cold form steel special bolted moment connections, or CFFS, CFSSBMF, is still prohibited by the CBC, but this is prohibited in 1617A.1.4C, item 12. Chapter 4 of AISIS 400 has quality control and quality assurance provisions. These provisions are not very extensive and actually frequently reference back to the AISI to S240 we, were, we already discussed, with the exception of the cold form steel special bolted moment frames. However, due to DSA lateral system prohibitions, which were already mentioned in 
the same slide, you can generally ignore Chapter G in AISI S400. Now moving on to wood. Recall we'd already mentioned that there's now a new reference standard, the NDS 2018. We'd also mentioned that there's some fastener changes that are due to the AIS ASCE 7 higher wind roof, that is suction loads. There's been added withdrawal capacity of stainless steel, roof sheathing ring shank, or RSRS nails, and head pull through. These are new in this new reference standard. The withdrawal capacity of stainless steel nails is much less than carbon steel nails. Therefore, as a project inspector, you should not allow a substitution of stainless steel nails without approval from DSA. The withdrawal capacity of RSRS nails are much greater than carbon steel nails. Therefore, you may see designers specifying that more often on your projects. There are also new fastener head pull-through provisions, but these are based upon the size and of the head itself. Therefore, you may see on your drawings designers specifying a minimum head diameter for nails. Continuing on with the wood in, in the CBC, 2303.2.2, there's other means of manufacturing to produce fire retardant treated wood. It clarifies that, that there's methods that are approved versus not, or not approved. The approved methods are those that produce FRT wood. The approved method are those that achieve chemical impregnation. That specific wording is indicated in the new language. What is not approved are the use of paints, coatings, stains, or other surface treatments that may have been seen previously or may sometimes occur on projects. However, we still allow recognition of these methods as an alternative means and methods. This is usually going to be accomplished through the use of a valid evaluation report. But again, talk with your field staff to ensure that these are acceptable. There may be a CCD that could be required as a result of this change if it was not already included in the approved construction documents. Regarding the labeling of fire retardant treated lumber, that's in section 2303.2.4. So the FRT lumber or sheathing requires labor, labeling required for fire retardant treated lumber as well as the usual labeling that's required in 2303.1.1 or 2303.1.5 for lumber and sheathing respectively. There's been some modifications to the fastening schedule in Table 2304.10.1, and the following is a listing of some of those items that have changed. These are generally due to the roof wind load that has increased compared to the previous load standard in the ASCE 7. For item number 7, the roof rafters to roof ridge or hip valleys, hip rafters, or roof rafter to two inch ridge beams has been increased from three to four 16 penny box nails. For item 17, the top or bottom plate to stud, that's actually been deleted since item 16 addresses the end nail option. The remaining items have been renumbered to, re to, re to recognize this modification. For wood structural panels, subfloor, for roof and interior wall sheathing to framing and particle, particle board wall sheathing to framing items for items 30 and 31 for 3 8 inch thickness to half inch thickness they've changed the 8 penny option from box to common as well as added an RS RS01 nail for 19 30 sec seconds thicknesses up to 3 quarters of an inch They've added an option for an 8-penny deformed, as well as an RSRS01 nail. Regarding section 2304.11 for heavy timber construction, in a sense you can now think of this section as becoming all things heavy timber. It reorganized the previous 2304.11, as well as the subsequent subsections. They've also moved, reorganized, and updated many of the provisions that were previously in 602.4 and put those into 2304.11. For 
For example, the minimum dimension requirements that used to be in Table 602.4 are now in Table 2304.11, and that's seen from this image here, which shows the dual asterisk to indicate that this is a relocation of previous code requirements, and that's shown as being highlighted in this slide. Continuing on with wood and what's new, 2304.12.1.4.1 has additional requirements for sleepers and sills at wood stud walls and partitions. There's been a clarification regarding the six inch curb is above the finished floor and pavement level in areas where water might pool, whether finished floor or exterior paved surfaces. Previously, with the way the language was written, you could have a situation where a curb was only higher than maybe what the finished floor was or the pavement level, but not be six inches above both. The intent was to make sure that you're above whatever is the closest so that you don't have issues with degradation of the wood in areas where water might pool. So this is the clarification of that requirement. In 2304.12.2.5, related to supporting members for permeable floors and roof decks, as well as 2304.12.2.6, which relates to the ventilation required beneath balcony or elevated walking surfaces. This is related to the 2015 Berkeley balcony collapse. We've repealed the emergency amendments that were included to address that, and these were related to requirements for ventilation, positive drainage, and so on. And the reason we've repealed that emergency amendment is because the model code now includes such requirements for those situations. There have been further editorial changes from the model code and relocating renumbering sections because of the definitional changes with relocations from what used to be definition specific to a chapter have been relocated to definition to chapter two definitions. Now we will go on to some of the non-structural chapters or non-structural provisions as far as in CBC chapters 1 through 16A and 24 through 35 that will be of interest to you as project inspectors. With regards to snow load posting in section 106.2.2 of the CBC, there's been modification to the load thresholds and posting requirements for DSA projects. Specifically, when the elevated, when the snow load is more than 50 PSF, when it occurs at elevated walking surfaces, and also if it's 20 PSF at the roof. Previously, that was just for 20 PSF at the ground level. So this is a modification and clarification for when snow load posting needs to be provided. This information should be identified already on your construction documents, but it's worth being aware of these minimum requirements and these modifications. We repealed the emergency amendment in the 2016 CBC in sections 107.2.7 as well as 110.3.8.1 for the exterior balconies and elevated walking surfaces since the model code now includes the requirements. This is again in relation to the 2015 Berkeley balcony collapse and specifically 107.2.7 is now covered in 107.2.5 and this relates to the details and manufacturers instruction installation Manufacturers' installation instructions of impervious moisture berries must be provided on the construction documents. And what was previously in 110.3.8.1 is now in 110.3.6, and that relates to the inspection and approval of all elements of the moisture barrier system before it gets closed in. So there is an element there for you as an inspectors there that wants to ensure that things have been properly installed prior to them closing in. So this relates to an element that you should be aware of should you have exterior balconies or elevated walking surfaces that are exposed to the weather. We've already discussed this particular item in other sections. That is that there's been a relocation of previous chapter specific definitions now have all been consolidated into chapter two. There have been some new definitions added as well. For example, there's been some new definitions related to equipment that relate to fixed, movable, and mobile. And this relates to 
anchorage requirements that you would see associated with such equipment. Jumping now all the way to chapter 12, and this relates to roof ventilation, so you can see that there's been a renumbering there. Including 1202.2.1, the ventilated attics and rafter spaces, and 1202.2.2, openings and into attic. These are the same as what they have been in the past. They've just been relocated to this new numbering. There's also been a renumbering for the sections identified here, 1203.3 to 1202.3, and 1203.4 to 1202.4. The requirements are the same as what they were in the previous code. There has just been a renumbering that's noted here. With regards to chapter 14, there's been a renumbering here as well. 1404 is now 1405, and 1411 is now 1410. The requirements are unchanged from the 2016, except as shown now for masonry veneer. Specifically, in table 1404.2, there is a modification regarding the minimum wall covering thickness that's seen here. For example, architectural cast stone replaces what used to be stone cast artificial. Additionally, there's new limits on the minimum thickness being required. For some, it used to be one and a half inches previously. Now it's only three fourths of an inch. This is for the architectural cast stone. And also, for previously adhered masonry veneer limit, that's not changed from what it was before, but it's now just referred to as other. Regarding anchored masonry veneer, that's now still 2 and 5 eighths, the 2.625, but it's now referenced as just being other within as being a subsection of or a subset of anchored masonry veneer. Recall that the TMS 402, chapters 12, as well as the CBC, Section 1410, slight renumbering there, have the minimum and maximum masonry unit thickness requirements for adhered and, an adhered and anchored veneer, which may govern over these minimums covered in this table. Continuing on with Chapter 14, Section 1404.18 relates to the polypropylene siding there's been a removal of the type 5B exterior wall construction limitation from the previous code, so you may start to see those now on type 5B construction. In chapter 15, there's been a renumbering for roof drainage of section 1502. I'm sorry, it used to be in 1503.4, has now been moved to 1502. For section 1504.3.3, metal roof shingles, there's now package labeling, which has indicated that it must be in compliance with the STM D3161 and required table 1504.1.1 classification compliance. So should you have metal roof shingles, you should verify that the product has this labeling identified. This should also be specified within the project approved construction documents, but this is where some of those requirements are now coming from. Section 1507.1.1 relates to underlayment, and there's been a significant modification here in that it consolidates, clarifies, and reorganizes, which is now in a tabularized format compared to what was there previously. There's many exemptions now allowed that were previously covered in, 15, in other subsections of 1507 for each roof type, for each roof type material. 1507.18 has building integrated PV roof panels. Therefore, you may see these on projects given the direction that many schools are going and other efforts in this state related to energy savings. Now we'll move on to the changes in Chapter 16A. One of the first items is that Chapter or Section 1616A was renumbered to 1617A, and the provisions are generally unchanged from the previous code cycle, except for those that will be enumerated below. In 1617A.1.18, this replaces ASC 716, that's the 2016 edition of ASC 7, of ASC 7 section 
This provides exemptions from seismic bracing, and those are mostly the same. However, they have been reorganized and clarified to some degree, and there are some additional changes. There is clarification that there's no anchorage that is required for temporary or movable or mobile equipment if it's connected to 110 or, 20 or 220 volt receptacles with flexible cables. It also, there's a new definition in which there's been a distinguishment between movable and mobile equipment and the restraint that's required for both. There is a repealing of the previous time limit, the non-use of eight hours, that was the time limit trigger for anchorage for movable, movable or mobile equipment. And for mobile equipment, the restraint is not required if it, can, if it is stored in a non-hazardous storage room as well as won't affect any facility systems or equipment if dislodgement occurs. So both conditions must be met in order for it to be exempt from the restraint requirements. In addition, there is this is a rather substantive change. DSA approved construction documents will be showing the anchorage for all the equipment and distribution systems. Continuing on now to 1617A.1.21, which replaces AC7 section 13.5.6.2 with regards to suspended ceilings, and this is covered in more detail in the inspection manual, section 2.5, that's what IM 2.5 stands for, there was an updated reference standard to ASTM E580-17, so that's the 2017 edition, and the section 5.2.8, the standard practice for installation of ceiling suspension systems for acoustical tile and lay-in panels in areas subject to earthquake ground systems. So that standard has been updated as far as that reference, the addition, that is. We've made some updates to IR-25-2, and that does occasionally occur. Keep in mind that IR-25-2, section 6.2 notes, indicates that the notes and details from that IR must not be used unless they are specifically incorporated into the DSA approved construction documents. You can also take a look at ASTM E580-17 for better sketches and information related to these topics. The next several subsections that we'll be going through in 1617A will be summarized in this slide here. So for 1617A.1.24 through 1617A.1.26, this modifies ASE 7, the 2016 edition. It modifies the sections for seismic design and detailing of distribution systems. It's worth noting that ASE 716 now provides a definition for distribution system in section 11.2. ASC 716 modified the previous, the 2010 version, uh, requirements. The modifications were mostly to exceptions to the seismic design and detailing. Now there are prescriptive requirements based upon testing and research. What this allows is the design professional to, to avoid project specific calculations and details in two broad categories. In the first category, trapeze assemblies or individual hanger rods meeting certain combinations of rod diameter, length, and supported weight. In the second category, when they can avoid impact with other components or protect them if, if they are impacted. What this means for you as a project inspector is that you're likely to see details meeting these exceptions. A good discussion and background on these changes are covered by a book ref referred to as the significant changes to the minimum design load provisions of ASC 716 and you could look up specifically for sections 13.6.5, 13.6.6, 13.6.7, 13 and 11.2. All right, so carrying on to the particulars now for 1617A.1.24, this modifies ASC 7 so to 2016. Section 13.6.5. So there are changes at the end and also in the exceptions 1A and 1B for the design professional seismic design and detailing of distribution systems. And these are generally 
part associated with conduit, conduits, cable trays, and raceways. At seismic joints, though, the conduits or cable trays and raceways with essential or hazardous contents must be detailed for the displacements, uh, such as having flexible couplings, regardless of the conduit size. There's no exception if the trade size is less than two and a half inches. And we'll cover that in a short while, why that particular size is noted. At component connections, cable trays and raceways have, must have flexible connections or equivalent assemblies that allow relative a, a movement. However, this requirement does not apply if the pipe, if the trade size is less than two and a half inches. Regarding support rods, they must be a minimum of a 3 8 inch diameter or half inch diameter that are rod hangers that are less than 12 inches in length for trapeze assembly or individual hanger rod and the support by each rod must be less than or equal to 50 pounds or for the case of a 100 or for the case of a trapeze it is allowed to be increased to double that to 100 pounds since that would be shared between each rod Continuing on, so for the support rods, it remove, the CBC amendments remove the ASC 716 13.6.5 allowances, which were for a half inch diameter rod and hangers, they could be less than 12 inches in length for trapeze assembly supporting less than or equal to 200 pounds, and if they were less than 24 inches in length for individual rod hangers supporting less than 100 pounds. So these were what were allowed in the model reference standard, ASC 716, but the CBC amendments do not allow these. For 1617A.1.25, this replaces ASC 7, section 13.6.6, .6, and the primary differences is, is that it changes the exceptions one and two for the design professional seismic design and detailing of distribution systems. These are applicable to the duct system. So they modified the wording from duct work to duct systems. So ASC 716 13.6.6 .6 language is more broad. Specifically it allows for HVACR and other duct systems, those must be designed for seismic forces and seismic relative displacements as required in section 13.3. The CBC changes to ASC 7 exceptions are similar to those already covered, however these are some important differences. When provisions to avoid impact or when provisions to avoid impact or protect when impacted are used and positively connected to the structure, then they must meet both being less than six square feet area and the there is an increase uh, from the limit from 10 pounds a foot to 20 pounds a foot. There's also a clarification regarding that inline components that are less than 75 pounds, if not otherwise independently braced, must be positively connected to rigid duct on both sides. So keep that in mind if you see these kinds of pieces of equipment. The exceptions that are allowed are not applicable to duct work carrying toxic, highly toxic or flammable gases or for smoke control. Now moving on to piping systems in 1617A.1.26 this replaces ASC 7 section 13.6.7.3 which are the exceptions to the design professional needing to provide special seismic design and detailing for, of piping and tubing systems for a given project. And it's broken out into three different scenarios. So the first one, A here, where flexible connections, expansion loops, or other assemblies accommodate relative displacement between component and piping where, piping, where the piping system is positively attached to the structure and where any of the following conditions apply. And there's four subcases. The CBC has changed ASC 7 exceptions to be similar to those already covered early in earlier slides, but here are, there, here are some of the specifics. For the first one, rods and trapezes do not support any pipes greater than three inches in diameter carrying toxic, hazardous, toxic or hazardous contents if it's 
less than or equal to two an inch diameter otherwise. This was, the, we repealed the requirement for these to have swivel joints. And now moving on to the other three cases here for case A, for the scenario A. So the second item, piping with a R sub P greater than or equal to 4.5 in ASCE 7, table 13.6-1, the rods or trapezes do not support any pipes greater than 3 inches diameter carrying toxic or hazardous contents. Otherwise, they must be less than 1.5 inches in diameter. Otherwise, we repealed the requirement for the swivel joints. Or, for the third item, Pneumatic tubes supported by trapezes must have a 3 8 inch max rod size, or number four, pneumatic tubes supported by individual rods must would need to match what's been stated already for other distribution systems. Now moving to the other scenarios for scenario B, the flexible piping connections must be in compliance with section 13.6.7.3 of ASC 7, that's not applicable where pipe is where the pipe is rigidly attached to the same floor or wall that provides vertical or lateral support for the equipment or to a fixture. And the last one here, scenario C, the flexible piping connections that are are required at seismic separation joints and shall be detailed to accommodate to accommodate seismic relative displacements at the connections. Moving on to chapter 24 related to glass, glazing, and so on. 2407.1.2, structural glass baluster panels. There's now an exception to this section related to requirements associated with the top rail or handrail. It recognizes that there's now a new ASTM E2353 test and that's required to ensure that the baluster remains in place. Therefore, you may see some labelies, labels indicating compliance with this new ASTM for glass baluster panels. For 2410, structural sealant glazing, or often abbreviated as SSG, there's been some section renumbering. Otherwise, the requirements remain the same as they were before. There's also been a renumbering in Chapter 25 related to JIP board. That's 2508.6 now. However, given that this is in relation to gypsum board diaphragm ceilings, DSA does not adopt those. We prohibit those except as specifically recognized in IR 25.3. Continuing with Chapter 25 in Section 2510.6, Water Resistive Barriers for Stucco, Regarding exception number two, there's a need for an air gap between the stucco and the water resistive barrier when that's applied over wood-based sheathing when you're in climate zones 1A, 2A, or 3A. Therefore, you as inspectors may see new details for the lath attachment to the substrate to accommodate this air, gra air, air gap. For chapter 26, 2603.13, for cladding attachment over foam sheathing to wood, furring, wood framing, there's requirements for cladding connections, and there are some exceptions. However, 2603.13.3 has some additional requirements for DSA and OSHPOD projects. Therefore, as inspectors, you should check the construction documents for additional anchorage and support details that may be applicable to your project.